Our next speaker is Congressman Dave Loebsack. He's a Democrat from Iowa City representing the second district. He was first elected in 2006. Congressman Loebsack. All right. Thanks, Carol. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Carol. Nice, nice short introduction. Thank you very much. Hey, it is great to be here, folks. I got to tell you, I think we're getting a little early onset grasshoppers here, though. But um, uh, this is, uh, oh, I can't even remember how many times I've done this now. I think every two years since 2006, when I first started running. And it's a great thing that these folks do. Um, and for me, I've, I've been at the State Fair quite a bit in the past. I, poor Terry has to hear me talk about the time in 1969 when I was 16 years old and I came down with a buddy from Sioux City and we spent a week up on the hill there in a tent. Uh, things were a lot different back in 1969 here. There were, a lot of these buildings were not as nice as they are now. Uh, but it's great to be here on Veterans Day too. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about veterans later and we've got some veterans in the audience. Veterans Day at the fair, um, I was there watching the parade. I try to do that every year. It's a really great thing. But this is a great idea to have the soapbox. I know you've already had a lot of folks up here speaking. You're gonna have a lot more uh, going forward till the end of the fair. Uh, I am running for another term. And I'm hoping that folks will get me reelected this time yet again. Uh, I started out in 2006. And it, it, it is the case that every time I run, I run for the same reason. And that's to make sure that we have opportunity for folks in America, provide the opportunity that I was provided when I was growing up. Some of you have heard my story. I often talk about my story. I grew up in Sioux City, and my mom was a single parent who struggled with mental illness. And she had an 11th grade education. And by all rights, I shouldn't be where I am today. Now, I know some in the audience might agree with that, but for different reasons. Uh, but but given, given my background, given how I grew up, um, I shouldn't have been able to get to where I am today. But when I was growing up, I had a lot of people who cared about me. I had a lot of family who cared about me, and I learned a lot about the value of family. But also, when I was growing up, I f figured out that there were some things out there that could help me get to where I want to be. And when I was 16, even though I, I took a week off to come here to the state fair, the rest of that summer, I worked 40 hours a week at the Sioux City waste treatment control plant, otherwise known as the Sioux City Sewage Plant, when I was 16 years old. And that job was a federally funded job for so-called disadvantaged youth. And that is the first 40-hour week job I had when I was 16 years old, between my junior and senior years in high school up at Sioux City East. And I wouldn't have been able to make it had it not been for that job because that job not only paid me a minimum wage all summer and I, you know, I got to do some fun things with that money, but also I was able to buy clothes for myself to go to college. I was able to save a little bit of money for college. Um, and a lot of that my mom couldn't provide because she didn't have the wherewithal to be able to provide for me. But I learned also about getting up early in the morning when you're 16 years old and driving yourself to work very early in the morning. I learned about taking care of myself and I learned about independence, but I learned also about responsibility. And I might not have been able to do that certainly at that age had it not been for that federally funded program. And I will never ever forget what I was allowed to do because of that program. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the Social Security survivor benefits that I received after my dad died when I was 16 years old in 1969. And it didn't matter that my parents were divorced. I was still able to take advantage of those Social Security survivor benefits. And that got me through Iowa State University. The low interest loans that I got to get me through Iowa State University. And other people who around me as well who were very caring and worried about me and wanted me to make it. I decided at a very early age that I was not gonna live in poverty when I was an adult. But I couldn't have gotten there had it not been for all these things that provided me that opportunity. So for me, this is personal, why I run for office. 
and the things that I've done in Congress. Because I wanna make sure that if you're willing to play by the rules and you're willing to work hard enough, that you have exactly the same opportunities that I had when I was growing up. That's why I'm doing this, folks. That's why I want people to support me, and I hope that you'll support me in this re-election bid. So, you know, going forward, what does that mean? You know, I, I talk about the middle class a lot, and I know a lot of politicians talk about the middle class. You know, I think a big part of why America is great already is because of the middle class. And I want to do everything I can to make sure that the middle class survives. And if you happen to fall out of it through no fault of your own, that you can get back into it. And if you've never been in the middle class, like me when I was growing up, that if you do play by the rules and work hard enough, you can get into it. You can get a good paying job with good benefits. And when I talk about the middle class, I talk about a job that's going to pay enough so that you and your family can maybe take a week or two vacation every year. So that maybe you can put a little bit of money away for your kid's college education if they decide to go to college. And it doesn't have to be a four-year school, by the way. It could be a two-year community college or a trade program or whatever the case may be. It's enough money so that you can have a decent house to come home to after work. It's about having enough money so that you can put a little bit of money away to supplement Social Security because you're probably not going to be able to stay in the middle class if all you do is rely upon Social Security and Medicare when you're a senior. That's what I'm talking about. It's not a particular income level because it'll vary according to where you are in the country. But it's making sure that you can make it the way that I was able to make it myself. And so... When I get around my district, all 24 counties, it's been the same thing for all 12 years. People are most concerned about the economy, folks. And we've got things are going reasonably well in the country at kind of the macro level. We got low unemployment. We got a good GDP growth rate. We've come back from 2008, that great recession. But we're not there yet. A lot of people have jobs, but they're not as good as they used to be and they don't provide the benefits that they used to provide. And I think that's a big source of why there's a lot of frustration and anger in this country right now when it comes to politicians promising things but not necessarily coming through with those promises and following through with those promises. So that's what I'm hearing more than anything is the jobs and the economy. So when I talk about opportunity, I talk about education. That, as we like to say, is a great equalizer. And it's not just a four-year college. My Iowa State time was wonderful. I represent the Hawkeyes in Congress. I'm all for you and I. I taught at Cornell College for 24 years. It, it, there you go. It's, thank you. Good to see you. It's also about those community colleges and those trades programs. Those can help provide an education for someone who can actually be in the middle class. Now, we have to make sure that those jobs don't get outsourced through bad trade agreements and that sort of thing, right? But nonetheless, that education is critical, folks, absolutely critical. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the education that I got when I was growing up. Beyond that, we've, when we talk about, about jobs in the economy, we got to talk about not just Des Moines or Sioux City or Iowa City or Davenport. We got to be talking about the rural areas too, folks. And this is something that, quite frankly, my party has not talked enough about, I would argue. But I don't think that politicians in general have paid enough attention to rural America. And it's not just rural America because it's important, but it's also important because we're all interconnected, folks. It's not just rural or urban. If somebody wants to access health care from a rural area, and that health care is going to be provided via telehealth somewhere here in Des Moines, we're connected. It's not just that rural part of Iowa that we're talking about. So there are a lot of things that we can do in rural America. The first thing that we can do, by the way, is make sure that we pass a farm bill that's bipartisan by September 30th. Can we all agree with that? Okay. Beyond that, we can make sure that whatever trade agreements we come up with, we come up with them sooner rather than later, and we don't create a situation where farmers are losing markets in China and Mexico and around the world. Can we all agree with that? 
Not only that, we have to make sure, and the EPA administrators here, I think, today, we have to make sure that we have a renewable fuel standard that is going to guarantee that there are markets for our corn growers and our soybean producers and provide thousands of jobs in Iowa going forward. I think we can all agree with that, can we not? And what about renewable energy besides ethanol and biodiesel? What about wind? I was in southern Iowa just the other day, very close to Missouri, and there's going to be a new wind farm down there eventually. I didn't think the wind blew enough there, but it does. And I was talking to the farmer who's going to hopefully rent some of his land to, some, to the company that's going to put these big turbines up. That is creating jobs for us, and solar is important as well. That's creating jobs for us, even in Iowa. Yes, today it's very sunny. It's not always. But solar is a growth industry here in the state of Iowa. So jobs in the economy is really what I've been focusing on. But I want to talk about two other things very quickly. Um, you know, when I first started running in 2006, George Bush, George W. Bush, had thankfully failed to privatize Social Security in 2005. He failed. It crashed and burned. Bipartisan opposition to it. Paul Ryan may be leaving as Speaker of the House, and I'm, I'm happy that's the case. But whoever replaces him, if the Republicans get the majority, will call for exactly the same thing. And that's privatizing Social Security and voucherizing Medicare. If anyone here thinks that you can take $6,000 or even $7,000 from the federal government and go out and get a policy, a health care policy at age 65, that is going to provide you anywhere near the benefits that you get on Medicare, well, I'm here to tell you that just isn't going to happen. So I am going to fight like heck to make sure that Social Security is never privatized and Medicare is never voucherized, folks. Never. The last thing, I'll tell you, the heat's good at keeping my, my speech short. You're all happy about that, I'm sure. But the last thing is our veterans. I want to come back to our veterans. We got some veterans in the audience. I know, I know some of them very well. Terry was just out, out at Camp Pendleton. My wife, Terry, she's here. She was out at Camp Pendleton. We had two Marine kids, uh, Marcos and Michelle. Terry's son, Marcos, and, and his wife, Michelle. They're both active duty Marines out of Camp Pendleton. They've been deployed a number of times. So again, I, I hate to make it too terribly personal, but it is because, because for quite some time, you know, we've, we've done a lot of things to try to help them out, babysit and all that sort of thing. But we've seen them go on multiple deployments. Uh, we've seen them leave. We've thankfully seen them come back. But I think that, <laughs> I think that, that politicians in Washington, D.C. often make decisions without thinking about the long-term consequences of those decisions on any number of fronts, but in particular when it comes to issues of war and peace. We are seeing now the results of decisions that were made, right decisions, wrong decisions, whatever you think they were. Long ago, we got two ongoing wars, essentially, okay? We are seeing the consequences of that. We have millions of folks Lots of folks who have served in those two theaters of war. We've seen those folks come back. Most of them have done okay when they've come back. Far too many have not done okay. They're struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. They're struggling with traumatic brain injury, which is often intimately connected to PTSD. They're struggling to get back into the lives that they had to leave when they were deployed. Nash, I don't want to take anything away from the, the, the active duty folks, okay, the regular military folks. They're deployed too, but it gets really hard often on, on our National Guard folks because, you know, they're here most of the time working full-time jobs, and then they have to go, and they leave their family and kids just like active duty folks do, regular Army, Marines, whatever. But then they come back, and they have to try to get those jobs back. And sometimes they can't get those jobs back. And it's very, very difficult. And in a place like Iowa, we don't have a big military base. 
where these folks can come and it can be a place where their families can go with them and they can get assistance and they can get counseling and all the rest. So I'm glad that we had folks from the VA in Des Moines and Iowa City sitting up on the stage for the Veterans Day Parade today. I know those folks. I've, I've been to many of the facilities, the community-based outpatient clinics and, and, the, and the big hospitals here in the state of Iowa. We've got to make sure, folks, and I'm going to leave you with this, that if we do nothing else, that when those troops are deployed and they have signed on the dotted line that they're willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, that when they come home, that we treat them with the dignity and the respect that they deserve. We've got to do that, folks. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to be out in the audience for as long as I can last in the heat. Uh, but, but thanks, everybody, for coming. I really, really appreciate it. I want to, again, thank the Des Moines Register for letting me do this. Uh, this is really, it is a great exercise in democracy. I know it's only been one way, but you'll get a chance to talk to me when I come down there. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>